This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 1st, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how last week Governor Dunleavy set the right goal for a fiscal plan, but why the question remains whether he and others will follow it up with the right proposals. Second, we discuss what Karl Mars and others in the top 20% really have in mind for Alaska. And third, we explain the key question about Alaska oil taxes that no one is asking. And now, let's join Michael. Weekly top three, uh, Dunleavy has talking a lot about balance. He's talking a lot about how you can't take from one to give to the other and other which sounds great on paper, but it's obviously nobody's listening. So uh, hit us with the beginning of the weekly top three here. Well, I think, uh, I think, you know, sometimes you look for quotes that sort of uh, uh, summarize or, or capture uh, uh, the the point you're trying to make and, and sort of, you know, play up that quote. And I think one of, one of the governor's quotes from last week's press conference where he announced uh, that there wasn't a fiscal plan. <laughs> Let's have a press conference to announce there's not a fiscal plan, but we hope there will be one. Uh, but one of the comments he made uh, in last week's uh, press conference, I think is one of those quotes I'm going to be coming back to uh, often. Uh, he said, a broad-based solution that doesn't gouge or take huge parts from one sector or another or penalize one sector or another is probably the most important thing we can do. And I absolutely agree with that. Um, he was talking about revenues uh, and and you know developing new revenues and 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 a, a, a fiscal plan that, that doesn't gouge uh, one sector or another. Um, and I think that's I think that's a great quote. It, it's in fact the quote that applies to the fiscal policy working group uh, and the work that they did uh, a couple of years ago. It's the quote that probably applies to. Uh, 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 Ben Carpenter's uh, Ways and Means Committee and the work uh, and the work they're doing, it's great to see the governor endorse it. Now, whether you know his plans have lived up to that's another question, uh, but I but it's it's a quote that I think uh, uh, really captures what we're trying to do. One more time, a broad-based solution that doesn't gouge or take huge parts from one sector or another, or penalize one sector or another, is probably the most important thing we can do. And I and and the converse of that is everybody's got to have some skin in the game. Um, we we shouldn't take too much from one sector. We shouldn't gouge one sector. We shouldn't you know do twenty POMV twenty five seventy five and take um, uh, you know solve the fiscal plan on the on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, but uh, the converse of it is that everybody's got to have skin in the game. Everybody's got to put. Uh, some skin in the game. That means something from the, just like the fiscal policy working group uh, uh, proposed, something from uh, uh, the the PFD, something from uh, upper income Alaska families through some sort of revenue, something from uh, uh, the oil companies uh, and, and so on. And I think that's, I think that is sort of the key that, that we ought to be looking for. Uh, yesterday's vote in the Senate was anything but that. Uh, it, it is, as Shelley Hughes put it, as a, uh, as Rob Myers put it, as Mike Shower put it, as even Forrest Dunbar put it, and I, you know, if somebody wants to, if what somebody wants to see a surprising speech from yesterday's floor uh, vote, go find Forrest Dunbar's because that was a remarkably 
uh, 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 a remarkable speech in terms of in terms of you know the stand he was taking for uh, for middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, as as they noted yesterday, as all of those floor speeches noted yesterday, the twenty five seventy five plan, or or as as Bert talks about it, and as Lyman talks about it, the seventy five twenty five plan, putting government first, and and you know appropriately. <laughs> In their minds, appropriately so, putting government first and the twenty-five percent to Alaska families. Um, the twenty-five seventy-five plan is anything but uh, a balanced approach. It, as Shelley pointed out, and as Rob pointed out, and as others pointed out, it uh, it it funds government on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. And for anybody to think, for anybody to think, you know, Bert made this long speech where he was throwing out a bunch of numbers and trying to give people the big picture. Well, the big picture. What 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 nobody noted was that the big picture is that twenty five seventy five doesn't solve the problem. If 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 the problem is a billion three, yeah, uh, which Bert kept coming back to 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 do all the things we need to do, we need a billion three in additional revenues. We need this. Uh, we need additional money in the CBR. If the number is a billion three, twenty five seventy five doesn't give you a billion three. It gives you a billion. It gives you enough to cover the deficit. Projected deficit, if, if a billion three is the total deficit you're looking at, gives you enough to cover the projected deficit, the sort of the build up to that over the next couple of years. But by the third year, we're back into deficits. And 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 you know, and and we need to remember that the proposed, the Senate proposed 2575 is just a statute. And and you know, listening to all these people talk about, oh, it's a statute, and and you know, and 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 we're really making a solid case here, and we're really making a solid stand. And this is the fiscal solution for well, it's a statute, right? And, and you and you've ignored well, the statute for the well, past, the statute that's already on the books for the past. So what? What you know? Well, what kudos, faith should we have that that the new statute you're enacting is going to is going to do anything? And kudos to Sean McGuire for mentioning this. He's the only one of all the reporting that mentioned that that the nonpartisan quote unquote legislative finance position projected that the seventy five twenty five would leave the state with a deficit within three years so it doesn't fix anything it's not a long-term fiscal plan it's a short-term band-aid on a spurting arterial wound we're going to take 75 percent, and that just means in three years they'll come back and say oh 100 100 100 it's got to be 100 percent." i mean that's what's happening well they'll ratchet it down over time it'll be it'll be 80 20 it'll be the 80 20 plan and then the 85 right. 15 plan and then the 90 10 plan and then maybe we'll get we'll get to the end of it but it's I, yeah it, it, Dunleavy has it right. Dunleavy has it right in terms of a little bit from everybody. No one gets gouged. Everybody contributes. And if everybody contributes, it's not that much from everybody. I mean, it's you go to POMB 50-50, which, which is consistent with what Hammond, you know, believed in the first place. Um, you take you take some from the oil companies. You take some from uh, upper income Alaska families through a through a, a revenue measure that 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 has them participating, unlike uh, unlike PFD cuts. Um, you take some maybe from tourists. Uh, uh, you take well, you take some from non-residents in some fashion, either through uh, through non-resident workers in the state, non non-residents with income in the state, or non-residents uh, uh, spending money in the state uh, as as tourists. You 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 get everybody in, and if you get everybody in, it's not that much from from each participant. Um, and then you then you put you put uh, uh, some sort of spending cap on top of that. Uh, you cap it off, and and that's a fiscal plan. But uh, but this approach that the Senate passed yesterday is is anything but a fiscal plan. It's as I think you've got a great quote on that. It's a band aid on top of a spouting ar arterial wound. Yeah, I mean, well, that's part of the problem all the time. It's we have to do something. We have to look like we're doing something. So we're trying to triage this, you know, and we're snake bit and they're like, oh, here's a lollipop. That'll help. I mean, it, it, it's just it's not working. I mean, what you're doing is a short term fix for a problem that you created and you're looking like you want to try and fix it. But the bottom line is you're setting us up for failure in the future. Like you said, maybe in three years with this deficit, if it if it if it everything went out the way they wanted with the 75, 25 uh, in three years, they may just turn it to zero or they just may ratchet. Oh, now it's 80. Oh, now it's 85. Now it's 95. You know, by the time you're at the five, six year mark, oh, it's 100 percent. Oh, and by the way, 
Now we need some form of taxation because we just can't. You need your services. It, it was it was disingenuous of Bert. I mean, half, after having run through all the, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, after having run through all those numbers, it was disingenuous of Bert not to admit that that this is this is just a temporary fix and it sets up sets up the next uh, the next step. It's we've got to have people who are honest uh, addressing this issue. And I, you know, and I need to, I need to recognize that the governor stepped up. The governor is stepping up and saying we need uh, revenues to fix this, but we need to fix it not on the backs of any one given uh, group. We need to, you know, everybody needs to chip in toward the solution. It needs to be balanced, not gouging um, any one group. And I, and I think that's great. Now the governor needs to step up and actually follow through on that. I mean, he needs to he needs to actually, you know, propose a plan that 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 does exactly what he's what he set out as the standard. Um, And it's and he's not done that. Uh, But but at least we have some standard now that that has been set out by at least one part of the government, the executive branch, as the standard that we're shooting for that that uh, that makes some sense. Now we need people to follow through. And now we pe- need people to be honest about the about the situation, as opposed to, you know, Burt's numbers games, where uh, where he doesn't admit that uh, we're right back into it in three years. Well, I think it's interesting that we're seeing more commentary. We had the Economist that was uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, you know, admitting that this is a tax on Alaskans and it disproportionately affects. You know, you got the governor saying it needs to be a more balanced approach and things like that. There are some people who were kind of been quieter about this that are now starting to point out the obvious part, saying the quiet part out loud that this disproportionately affects the lowest, you know, 50 percent of income earners in the state of Alaska. And it really doesn't help the middle class either. I mean, the only ones benefiting are the top 20. Right. It's, it's not, it, you know, people talk about this being a low income, low income issue. It's not. I mean, middle income Alaska families, 80 percent of Alaska families, including and and depending upon how you break up the brackets, uh, if you break them up into quintiles, you've got the low 20, the low middle 20, you've got the middle middle 20, the high middle 20. And then the and then the upper twenty, um, the sixty percent in the middle, all the 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 low middle, the middle middle, and the upper middle are all disproportionately affected by uh, by using PFD cuts. They all would pay less, contribute less, be required to contribute less uh, through uh, through another revenue mechanism, I mean, whether it's sales taxes or, or 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 flat taxes or income taxes, whatever it is. They all would. They all would contribute less. Yeah, I mean, look, a, a family of four making one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year. Family of four. If you took, you know, you take their three PFDs away or the majority of them away, that's ten percent. That's like nine thousand bucks that's being taken right out of their pockets. I mean, that's not an insignificant amount. That's almost what's that eight nine percent. I mean, that's insane. I mean, it does affect people who are in the middle income as well. It just affects those who are in the lower income more. And at least people are starting to admit it uh, and admit that it's a tax. I mean, that's the that's the big thing. It it It's a taking. And I know the legislature, well, you know, services and we've got to. Oh, that's insane. It's absolutely insane. You juxtapose you juxtapose Kathy Giesel's uh, 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 floor speech yesterday against Forrest Dunbar's. I mean, everybody expected Shower, Shelley and Rob uh, to do a great job defending the PFD. But the one I, I really want people to focus on is Forrest Dunbar's speech. You juxtapose Giesel saying, "Oh, we gotta, you know, we gotta, we gotta take this money because we gotta spend on government to protect all these people." You juxtapose that against Forrest's uh, argument that, "Look, you're taking too much money from middle and lower income Alaska families. We need to be fair about this. Uh, we need to have a full fiscal plan that treats everybody fairly, not just take it off the backs of, of lower of middle and lower income Alaska families." And he used that phrase, and and it's, and you've got, and you see, you know, you you see the the difference between the top twenty percent Republicans. What that really tells you is the difference between the top 10 20 percent Republicans. Ooh, we need government spending, but we don't want to pay for it. And and somebody who truly is focused on middle and lower income Alaska families, eighty percent of Alaska families. Yeah, maybe we need government, but. It shouldn't be done on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. So, I, yeah, there, there is these sprouts, these sprigs, like like the governor's quote. There are these sprigs of green that are that are coming through, coming through the snow. But you know, we aren't we aren't at a fiscal plan yet.
Well, yeah, we're nowhere near a fiscal plan. Brad, this is, again, the theater. I mean, this is really what it was. It was Kabuki Theater on the floor of the Senate yesterday telling us all these things about, oh, we can't, you know, we've got to. And, and this is the irony. The House, members of the House, Kevin McCabe, et cetera, actually compromised and said, okay, we'll come off the full PFD down to the 50 50 pfd because that's hammond's vision we don't we want we'd like to stay at it but we'll come down as a compromise and the other side's like okay great so we're going to move it to 75 <laughs> 25. it's it's not how compromise works i mean that's not how it's but but this is they are just bound and determined to get to that point to where government sucks up all the oxygen in the room and now apparently kevin said i didn't even notice this they want to spend 1.4 billion dollars to inflation proof the the pomv plan is it's got built-in inflation proofing that's what it's supposed to now you want to take another billion i mean how are you ever going to get to the 1.3 billion in new revenues and three and a half billion in the cbr it's a pipe dream it's never going to happen it's basically them going let me give you the finger and then see what's going you know good luck getting to that side you know i mean that's it's exactly what it is it's uh, it, was, it, it was humorous it was humorous to he hear uh, uh lyman and and burt to some degree you know defend defend uh, uh 75 25 we got to remember they're putting government first in these numbers 75 25 uh, it was humorous to hear them uh, uh, defend that and say, "Well, we're giving you a we're giving you a plan. We're giving you a way to uh, to develop uh, uh, new revenues and to get back to 50-50, to buy your way back to 50-50. By the way, you have to pay more uh, than than just the difference between twenty five seventy five and fifty fifty. You have to pay about a billion dollars more, and you have to put money into the CBR to do it. But but we're giving you a way to, to a way to get back." to hear to hear them do that and then hear kathy geisel you know well we can't do it on the backs of the of the of the resource companies my god that would be a horrible way to do it um and and you know that bert's chairman and and intends to stay chairman for life of senate finance and block any any revenue measures that he that he doesn't like so here's a plan oh by the way we're in charge of whether you get whether you get that additional revenue and we're opposed to new revenues coming from anybody else other than middle and lower income Alaska families, but, but here's your way to do it. It was, it was, it was Kabuki theater. I agree with that. It was disingenuous. It was dishonest. Yeah. It was, it was, yeah. it was not telling Alaskans the truth. It's like, and, it's like, we're all going to play this air hockey game. And this one, my friends is for all the marbles. And then Bert Stedman takes a milk carton and puts it right in front of his goal. Go for it. There you go. You can make it. It'll be fine. I mean, it, wait a second. I mean, this is, the, the field is rigged from the very beginning. And like you said, yeah, Bert Stedman, he wants to be finance chair for life. And as far as I can tell, although somebody from Sitka the other day, I was speaking with somebody from Sitka and they said, well, there's a move to get him out. And I'm like, why? He's giving them everything that they want. Uh, and there obviously is Seattle North for many of the people that are down there at Sitka, it seems like. So why would they want to change out Bert? Because he's giving them everything they want. It seems to be no indication in the last 15, 18 years that he's been in there, that there's anybody that could move him off the, off the dime right now. I mean, well, maybe. And, and, and he of Lyman have shown, I mean, as, as it, with the Senate as closely divided as it truly is, if it, this Senate doesn't, re, doesn't reflect the, the true division that's in there with the Senate as divided as it, as it truly is, Bert and Lyman, you know, and Donnie are willing to go either any direction, just as long as they're in power, just as long as, as they get to continue to be a, uh, uh, chairs or co-chairs, uh, uh, you know, the senator from uh, 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 Fairbanks, Click Bishop, is is another one of those. We'll, we'll go. We, we don't care what side we're on as long as as long as we're in power, as long as we're the ones that are able that's, to do it. So that's the word you know, power. And, yeah. And, and and so Bert is sitting there going, I'm I'm just gonna you know keep playing the game and I'll continue to be here. And yeah, yeah, you can earn your way back into it. You can pass all these revenues. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, try and do it. Try and do it through my committee, but you can pass yeah. all these ready. Don't worry, I got it. It's all taken care of. Don't worry about it. I mean, you know, come on, seriously. The walrus has spoken. Um, all right. Uh just it's dude, I'm just so I'm so frustrated watching this. I mean, I knew this was going to be a bad year. I knew this was going to be a year where nothing was going to get done. Then we saw how the majority shook out. I knew it was going to be even worse. And now here it is. And this is a this, my friends, is a stereotypical example of the direct application of trying to of the retention of power. 
That's exactly what it is. But you are 100% right. Click and Bert and all these guys would be like, I'll wear whatever animal you want on my lapel as long as I can still sit here at this table and be the one that directs everything. I don't care. There's there, It's all about pro-government spend at, at, at any cost. At any cost to the private sector. doesn't matter what it does to the private sector. As long as our spend is protected, we're good to go. Brad, give me a tease for number two. Uh, number two, which is the top 20% creating their own little refuge, their own little paradise. Carl Mars, uh, uh, who's, a, who's a great foil. Uh, Carl Mars wrote an op-ed in the ADN that I got to admit, I just laughed all the way, all the way through. It's so transparent what's going on. Mars's uh, headline was something like, Alaska doesn't need new taxes. The, the subtext of it was Alaska doesn't need two, new taxes that reach the top 20%. We're just fine with taking taxes from middle and lower income Alaska families. But we're going to talk a little bit about Mars's editorial and we're going to talk a little bit about what, you know, what the, what, what his, what he and the other, uh, his friends in the top 20% are trying to, uh, trying to achieve. Wait, you mean they're trying to shield themselves from paying any more? Shocking, I tell you. Absolutely shocking. I'm flabbergasted. Number two is the direct top 20% utopia that they're trying to create. Brad, hit me with your thoughts on what's going on right now with the powers that be in the legislature. Well, Karl Mars uh, writes these op-eds uh, near the end of every session um, and, and, and it's intended to, you know, play all the, 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 the flag of, of no taxes. And, the, and the, uh, it's really the same op-ed just written every year with a few new words. But this one is Alaska doesn't need new taxes. Well, we already have taxes. PFD cuts are taxes. We're, we're long since past uh, recognizing that. So what, what, what Mars is really trying to do is say, we don't need taxes on the top 20%. We need to continue harvesting the taxes we have on middle and lower income Alaska families, PFD cuts. We need to continue relying on those. We don't need new taxes that might reach the top 20%. And what, what's really going on here and I, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm repeating myself from prior programs, but what's really going on here is the top 20% are trying to create this, this tax haven nirvana, this Alaska tax haven nirvana, where they get all the government services they want, increase K through 12, the university fully funded, big trans, big uh, capital budget. So the contractor portion of, uh, of the top 20% get all the, get all the profits they need. Uh, uh, you know, child care. Now we're going to have government subsidized child care. That's in the Senate. That's in the Senate budget uh, where they have all of these government services, but they don't have to pay for it by pushing the cost down to middle and lower, lower income Alaska families. And they keep trying to sell Alaska as no taxes. We're a no tax state. Well, it's no taxes for the top 20 percent. It's a great haven, tax haven for the top 20 percent. We're sort of like we're sort of like one of these Caribbean countries now, you know, we're a tax haven, but we're only a tax haven for for a portion of the population. We're a por for, we're a tax haven for the for the for the those in the top twenty percent. We're not a tax haven for anybody else. So you get you get this nirvana out there of fully funded government services, a lot of government services. Complain about not having enough government services, Kathy Geisel. Ah, oh, we need more money to to have more government government services. You know, we need we, teachers. Uh, need more money? Well, let's just fund. Let's just fund. Let's just you know give more money to the BSA. Let's create more money for K through twelve. The university. Oh, we need the university for stuff. Whatever we need the university for, let's give them more money. Roger Hickel needs more capital budget. Well, let's give him some more money. Let's let's increase the let's increase the capital budget. But let's make sure that we don't have to pay for it. And and when you read these op eds, you really need to understand what they're arguing for. They're arguing for no taxes on themselves. Right. They don't, care. They before, don't care about anybody else. Yeah. And again, I mean, they're, you know, some of the commentary and things like, oh, you know, you're just for taxes. We are. Okay. Let me point it out. We, no, let me come to me first. Let me come to me. We are already being taxed. Everybody in the state's being taxed. Unfortunately, it's disproportionately affecting the lowest 60% of income earners uh, to some, well, to the majority of the extent, even the lowest 80%. We are already being taxed. That's the bottom line. I mean, right, Brad? I mean, that's that's the point. The point is, is what we have right now, 
protects government spend above all else. And and as you said accurately, I think that word works well, harvests it from the lowest 80 percent, which are the I mean, that's the vast majority of the population. The top 20 percent is a smaller slice. I mean, fractionally smaller slice. And they are the ones that are going like, sure, go ahead, make that new program. No problem. We, 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 we're happy with it. We'll create a company that actually services that and takes money from the government for that. We'll do that. That makes it, that's a good idea. Cap, that's an entrepreneurship. Yeah. The no taxes. I mean, I, I, I've become very intolerant of, of those who go around saying no taxes, no taxes. We already have taxes. What, what you're really arguing for is, is no taxes on the top 20%. That's just, I mean, that's, that's just the basics of, of, of what you're arguing for. And that's, you know, if you're in the top 20%, I understand why you're doing that. If you're in the bottom 80%, I don't quite get why you're doing that because you're just helping out the top 20% keep their, keep their nirvana. We are only going to get government spending under control. We are only going to get government spending control when, as Dunleavy says, everybody, well, the, the reverse of what Dunleavy said, everybody has skin in the game. We are only going to get government spending under control once everybody has skin in the game. If you leave some group out, I don't care if it's the top 20%, the bottom 20%, the middle 20%. If you leave some some group out, they're going to continue to press for spending because they don't have to pay for it. You're only going to get spending under control if everybody has to contribute toward the cost. You get spending, you get you 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 extend the, the responsibility to contribute to government, to Natasha von Imhoff, to Karl Mars, to others, all of a sudden, to the Binkleys, all of a sudden they're going to be saying, wait, we don't need to be subsidized child care. We don't need to be doing sub state subsidized child care. You're going to have that sort of reaction. If they have to pay a part of the bill, you're going to have that sort of reaction. But as long as they're able to push it down to middle and lower income Alaska families, as long as Karl Mars is no taxes is, is the mantra um, you're going to continue to get state subsidized child care. You're going to get continue to get BSA increases. You're going to continue to get um, uh, big capital budgets. You're going to continue to get uh, university spending because they enjoy the benefits of it, but they don't have to pay for it. Get everybody in the game, and then we'll get a rational fiscal plan. Leave somebody out of the game, bottom 20%, top 20%, and we won't have a rational fiscal plan because somebody will have an incentive to continue, continue to push for spending because it's on somebody else's back. Right. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets is our guest. Brad, this goes right back to what I've been saying for the last, uh, I guess, two years more than anything else. We've really got to stop looking at this from a partisan standpoint of Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative. This really, in this state, it is broken down to a very unique dichotomy. It is the pro-government spend versus the pro-private sector spend. That's really what it's breaking down to right now. And unfortunately, we've got this weird divide where we've got a welfare state that, that again, fixates on the lowest income earners getting welfare of one type and the highest income earners getting welfare of another type, the corporate type welfare. And so we're in a very unique place in this country uh, when it comes to these kind of things. And I mean, it's really the uh, a marriage made in hell because it's, it's, it's created this dichotomy and this push pull where the public sector is supreme over all things. Yep. Yep. And Rob Mars, Rob Myers makes the, makes the best point about that. Rob Myers says, you want, you want to, you want to build something in the state. You want money to do something in the state. You've got to go to state government. I mean, they've created a system where you've got to go to state government because they're the ones that have all the money. What Hammond did through the PFD was try to try to get some of that money in the hands of the people so people could make their own decisions about when they do, what they wanted to do. Entrepreneurs could have, you know, some sort of cash flow, some sort of nest egg to be able to build up um, and do something. But now with PFD cuts, they're taking that source of money into the private sector out of, out of it converting it over to government and creating a situation in which, in which only government 60 plus one decide, you know, what gets funded in the state, what gets done in the state. And so they created a situation where the top 20% who want more money, they want to go to, you know, let's have a bigger capital budget. Let's have a bigger K through 12 budget. Let's have a bigger, you know, uh, university budget, but don't make us pay for it because, you know, we're the beneficiaries of it. We, do, we don't want to have to pay for it. Right. Let's just, let's just continue building government. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a unique system. I mean, 
I try to explain this to people in the lower 48, my friends in the lower 48 that are involved in, in fiscal policy, and they go, we don't understand that. Yeah. And, and, and you don't understand it because we've got this we've got this weird, hugely regressive tax that's uh, that, that's funding all of it. Well, and Hammond never put it in these terms, but essentially with the PFD, he was trying to strengthen the connection between the public and the private economy because he could see what was happening. The legislature took those monies, like that first nine hundred million dollar payment, and they blew through it like it was a house of fire. And he could see what was going to happen. It was going to grow government outside of the control of the people. And so although he didn't put it in those terms, the PFD was created to ultimately create a stronger linkage between the public and the private sector. And they've been whittling away at it since 2016. Hammond Hammond did understand. Hammond did say things that 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 connect to that. I mean, Hammond said if you want more spending, if you want more spending than than what you know the other 50 percent can can provide, then we need taxes, and taxes are the mechanism. You know, the sort of Damocles that would hang over the legislature's broad based taxes, the sort of Damocles that would hang over the legislature's head. And say you want more spending, then you're going to have to Im- impose taxes, broad-based taxes that will affect the top 20%, will affect all Alaska families, and they'll push back on it. What's happened is by by not using taxes for the additional revenues to allow them to use additional PFD cuts, you've taken that sort of Damocles away, hanging right. over the legislature's head, and so they just continue spending because they don't have to they don't have to respond to their donors to the t- in the top 20%. I mean, tell me how you really feel. Um, <clears throat> it's it's infuriating because you can see they literally are like taking hatchets to the to the to the cable to you know they want to they want to be free of that private economy. They don't want to have any consequences. They just want it to live in its own little government run self contained bubble. As long as we can, that was the whole talk about the hundred billion dollar permanent fund. If we can get it to that, then we could just spin off money. Although. Looking at the historical spending habits of the legislature, that wouldn't last long. It wouldn't be five percent anymore. You know, it would be, oh, we we need more than five billion. Now we need a hundred and twenty billion dollar fund, or a hundred and fifty billion dollar fund, or a four hundred billion dollar fund, because there's no way they could live within their means. To that point, it's interesting to see the evolution of the discussion of of twenty five seventy five. I refuse to say seventy five twenty five twenty five seventy five. It's interesting to see the evolution of 2575 over the course of this legislature, maybe the last two legislatures. First of all, when, when 2575 was first proposed, it was going to spin off a bunch of savings, right, that would go into the permanent fund um, and, and and build up that permanent fund to 100 to 100, the 100 billion dollars. They no longer talk about it that way. The reason they no longer talk about it that way is spending has increased to the point that they need 2575 just to pay for just to pay for ongoing government expenses. I mean the the Senate budget this year is at 2575 and it's got a 90 million dollar a, a fraction of 1%. They got a 90 million dollar um, uh, surplus that'll be eaten up before before the budget gets taken before the budget fully goes through. And 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 that's all that's left out of this huge surplus that they said they were going to run with 2575 when they when you know last legislature earlier this legislature when they talked about 2575 it was going to get us through the next 10 years without deficits and then we'd address it at the end of the 10-year period now it gets us through two years uh uh before we before we run back into deficits and what's right. happened is spending is spending is creeping right on up oh 2575 well that's all that government money let's have a bigger capital budget let's let's do the bsa let's do no. you know k through 12 let's fully immediately, fund the, the immediately consumed immediately consumed it won't be 24 months and they'll be right back to the drawing board again because it is not a fiscal plan it is not a fiscal plan they're just like fill the hole it's like the it's like the the bucket with a hole in the bottom and they just keep shoveling stuff into it and they're like well i don't know why this bucket won't fill up uh, because you're spending it faster than you could put it in there. That's for sure. Um, Jim asked the question, uh, Brad, and this is a good one for you. When you're talking about the top 20% and the lower 80%, what income ranges are you talking about? Um, top, when you're talking- top 20% is about $120,000 uh, household income and above. Yeah. In Alaska. In, in Alaska. Alaska. Yeah. It's, so top, <clears throat> yeah. So top 20% is, uh, is a pretty significant chunk, but even then, like I said, when you're talking about lower to middle income or even high middle income in the hundred thousand dollar range uh, for a family of four, I mean that's that's a significant amount of money when you're talking about taking eight, nine, ten percent out of it 
every year, it still hurts. I mean, I, I guarantee around my house, it still hurts. Um, when, when you see that, when you've got, you know, four or five people, six people who are supposed to get dividends and all of a sudden there's, it's crickets. You're like, Ooh, that was stuff that we could have really done some good with and you can't do it. And you're just, it's taxed right out the door. Yep. It, it's, uh, I mean, it's, and, and, and at the lower level, at the lower level of the top 20%, it's, it's still fairly close. I mean, it's still, uh, uh, a flat, a flat tax and, uh, PFD cuts take just about the same at the lower level of top 20%. It's once you kick in, I mean, to some degree, um, uh, uh, the proposal on a, on an income tax, that would kick in at $200,000 had it right. That's really where you start feeling the difference between, um, uh, PFD cuts and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, a flat tax. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Um, I was going to ask you, uh, you know, more of your thoughts on the, uh, on the floor session yesterday. Cause I only got a chance to watch a couple of the speeches. Uh, I couldn't make it through Bert's speech because I just started to watch it. And then I was like, no, I can't, I can't, I'm getting dumber by the minute. I cannot do that. Um, but there was a lot of, of that whole, well, the government really takes care of you in every aspect. So we have to make sure that it's fully fun. And I kept thinking, if you gave Alaskan families, the average family of three or four, their full dividend, that would probably go a lot further than trying to provide somebody with services that they will, they may need, or they may utilize or may never utilize, especially the lower middle income folks. I mean, they, they don't qualify for most of that stuff and you're taking it right out of their pockets. Yeah, Shelly Shelly had a had a had a great as I said earlier, Shelly had a great rejoinder to Kathy Geisel when Kathy was saying, "Oh, we need, you know, we need this government money because we need to fund people to send out uh, 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 food stamps." And and Shelly said, "Well, why don't we just give the dividend to those in the lower income Alaska lower income Alaska families so they can pay for their own groceries as opposed to having to wait for government to." to come along, uh, yeah. uh, uh, to pay for it. I, it, it, people need to, people need to watch. If, if you're really interested in the floor debate yesterday, you need to watch Rob and, and Shelly and, and shower, but also include Forrest Dunbar's speech in there. I, right. I was, I was sort of shocked. Um, uh, but Forrest gave an excellent, um, uh, 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 rejoinder to, uh, to yeah. the, to the proposal on the floor yesterday. And I think it's a great, I think it's a great well, speech. Again, uh, like I said, the lowest income earners at least have access to some of the social safety net stuff that they keep talking about. It is really those who are just outside of that, who make too much money to be able to participate in that, that are harmed the most by that. And that's, and you know, and that's why the top 20% try to emphasize lowest, that PFDs yeah. are good for lowest, but you know, we're not, but we've got other ways, you know, what they say is we've got other ways of taking care of, uh, taking care of them. It's middle income Alaska families that are really getting hosed by PFD cuts. They're the ones that are, that are losing more through PFD cuts than they would, uh, than they would through taxes. And, right. and that's where we, that's, that's the focus of the argument. Absolutely. Number three, Brad, and this is uh, one of the things is the question that nobody's asking about oil taxation yet. Now, again, to clarify for those nervous Nancys and Karens out in the chat room and out in the world, uh, Brad is in favor of changing the taxation structure on the uh, oil companies. We've talked about this for maybe $500 million still left on the table that we could be getting there. Uh, he does not have a lot of friends left in the oil companies after he supported some of the repeals and things and, and everything else that was going on and SB 21 and all that. Um, but uh, this is specifically about uh, a question on the oil taxes, Brad. So yesterday, one of the, one of the other things that happened yesterday was a hearing in Senate finance, two hearings, in fact, in Senate finance uh, on oil taxes, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. They were supposed to take public comment uh, in the afternoon, but the hearing went long. The hearing with the invited guests went long. So they put off uh, public comment. And I was real. I was really disappointed um, uh, in in the hearing uh, the hearings thus far. I mean, it's it's like it's like everything else. We get into these polar opposites with the oil industry saying no taxes, any taxes, any tax increase would be bad. In fact, at one point they implied that they needed to tax decrease uh, in order to uh, continue to have an incentive to uh, develop. And then we have the Willikowski bill on the other 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 side that says you know we just sort of need to tax tax as much as we possibly can think of taxing. Um, and, and it's, and we've got into these polar opposites again, 
that uh, that I think, you know, just we don't have a lot of time left. And so everybody's going to lock into their foxholes and and fight it, you know, throw shots across the across the field at each other without really trying to get to the center. Oil taxes are a math problem. They're nothing more than a math problem. Uh, the, and, and the math problem is what's the revenue maximizing point uh, for oil taxes? And it is it's a question of how much can you how much tax can you can you levy in, in whatever form, property tax, production tax, royalty, doesn't really matter. How much government take can you levy without killing the golden goose, right? Without without tipping over uh, uh, the, the the decline curve into so steep a decline curve that you actually lose money. I mean, you can increase you can increase your per barrel take to the point that that you know there's no investment and and the decline curve ends up with Alaskans getting less money uh, out of the oil industry than uh, than they are now. And it's a math problem. It's 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 where it, where is the sweet spot? Where is the revenue maximizing point? How much can we take, how much can government take without tipping the decline curve over to the point where after a few years, we're actually losing money from where we otherwise would be if we kept, if we kept, kept taxes, uh, kept taxes level. It's, it's a, it's a formula. It's a, it's a, give me the inputs of what the decline curve is. Let me focus on at, at various revenue levels, various government take levels. Let me focus on those government take levels and let me figure out what the revenue maximizing, the revenue maximizing point is. Nobody talked about that yesterday. It was it was everybody to their foxholes. I mean, it, it, Aoga was so bad that they were even defending the Hillcorp loophole. I mean, come on, you can't defend the Hillcorp loophole. The, the Hillcorp loophole is BP paid so much as a C corp. Hillcorp is an S corp, which means they're they're organized as an LLC. They came in and bought BP, so no longer are is are they paying taxes at the corporate level. They're not paying taxes at the individual level because we don't have an income tax at the individual level. And so there's about a hundred million dollar gap uh, between what be, what would have what the state would have received had it continued to be, be owned by BP and what the state's receiving uh, as a result of Hillcorp having replaced BP. That's it. That's that's the that's the Hillcorp loophole. Nothing to do with increased production incentive, no, nothing to do with investment levels. That's it. That's the difference between the two. And and Aoga is so in their foxhole, foxhole that they're defending even that. I mean, I can see the, the internal Aoga board meeting, which was, we're all in this together, right? We're all going to defend each other, right? You know, we're not going to start picking fights with each other, right? So we're all going to defend everything. And so they're over in their foxhole. And Wilikowski, to his credit, is out there at the other side. And Brennan's out there at the other side saying, we can take all this money from them. I mean, you know, you you compare it to North Dakota, you compare it to some other state that we pick, cherry pick, and we can take all this money from them. Well, the problem is if you take all that money from them, you may tip them over. There may not be enough investment. The decline curve may be steep and we may end up as Alaskans, we may end up losing more money. So the middle ground is let's do the basic math. Let's figure out what the decline curve is. Let's figure out the revenue maximi maximizing point and let's go to the revenue maximizing point. No crickets uh, on that issue. Department of Revenue spoke, uh, the administration's Department of Revenue, who really, you know, the administration is the one government body that has enough information to be able to figure that out. They've got Department of Natural Resources that, that calculates decline curves. You've got the Department of Revenue that calculates various ways of, of capturing the revenue. The government, the administration is the one focal point that, that really could uh, could figure out, uh, figure this out other than the oil companies. But they spoke and they there wasn't anything even approximating an estimate of the of the revenue maximizing point. So we're, we're, we're in this we're in this debate again about oil taxes. There is money to be had. Certainly the Hillcorp loophole needs to be closed. There's money to be had from from uh, from the other fields by figuring out the revenue maximizing point but no one's trying to do it and and if we continue down this road of everybody in their foxholes nobody trying to figure out nobody doing the math the math calculation nobody figuring out the math problem we're never going to get to an answer we're going to keep we're going to keep you know as you and I have talked about on various other things about fiscal policy we're going to keep running from one side of the ship to the other side of the ship well, you know yeah. capsizing ourselves over 
that's the problem with focusing on the extremes, right? The extreme of, oh, we'll take $1.5 billion on the one side or 1.3 or whatever the number is, or no, leave it exactly like it is. We're doing just fine. Everything, you know, it's the extremes. There's no, uh, no discussion. And it doesn't seem there's like any real push to find the middle. Now the house has been talking about that has been talking about uh, a, a change in the oil tax structure, but in the uh, fiscal policy working group thing, they were talking about like three hundred million dollars. So that seems like that was somewhere in the middle. Where is the you know is is anything coming out of there that that is asking that question? I, the House has talked about closing the Hill Corp loophole. They've talked about some adjustments on the per barrel uh, credits, but I'm not seeing even on the House side. I'm not seeing a presentation on revenue maximizing the revenue maximizing point and calculating the revenue maximizing point. It's a simple math calculation. It's you need data to do it. You need to understand the decline curves to be able to do it, but it's a simple math calculation to do it. And I've not seen on either side, anybody trying to do that. It's sort of like we were talking about the elephant, the old elephant story about, you know, somebody touches here and they think it's a bear or somebody touches there and they think it's a horse and they don't see the big picture that it's, that it's an elephant. That's what we've got going on in the legislature about oil taxes. They're, they're touching here and saying, oh my gosh, look at North Dakota or whatever other state I want to cherry pick. Look at North Dakota and, and you know, they can tax, you know, tax up to this. And North Dakota that doesn't have the type of uh, climate that we have, the entire envir environmental issues that we have, but we can tax up to this. And then, you know, <laughs> the AOGA, God love them, saying, oh, well, you can't touch anything. In fact, you really need to reduce taxes to, to, to maximize production here. It's, it, it's, a, it's a strange, for, for a government that is so tied to oil, that's so dependent on oil revenues, it's very strange to see how little we actually think through the issue and, and, and do the math problem, that's all it is, and do the math problem and come, uh, come to the conclusion of the revenue maximizing point and then move on. We just, Kevin, we just, we, we just don't do it. Kevin McCabe in the chat room says there's no way to calculate the threat of oil companies stopping immediately investing in Alaska. How do we calculate that? And I think you just answered that. The governor has a lot of those numbers in the Department of Revenue, Department of, of DNR, I mean, uh, the natural resources and stuff. They could pull that together, at least put together some kind of model, right? I mean, but it's not just, you can't just back of the napkin it. You got to have some hard numbers to know what's going on to begin with. When we did, when when the state debated uh, going to uh, 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 a profits-based tax in the early 2000s, 2004, 2005, 2006, we all ultimately ended up going to the extreme with ACES. But when we debated it in 2004, 2005, 2006, there actually was some serious effort by both the oil companies. There actually was a collaborative effort by both the oil companies and the state to figure out the revenue maximizing point. That ultimately got lost in the in Murkowski's decline, the rise of Sarah Palin, the the LNG project and everything else. It got very murky uh, uh, in the middle 2000s, but there was actually an effort to do it. It is calculable. I mean, it takes it takes effort. It takes it takes concentration. It takes an understanding of the international uh, oil industry. Uh, and we hired experts uh, uh, back in the middle 2000s to do it. It is it is possible to do it. The state the state was on track to do it in the middle 2000s, and then it blew up with uh, with Palin and Murkowski. But it's not. I mean, it, we shouldn't dismiss it and say there's no way to do it. There is a way to do it, and 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 the effort the administration needs to put in the effort to do it. The legislature may need to hire experts to do it, but there is a way to do it. And just you know, waving your hands and saying, "Well, I can't do that," is is the is the wrong answer. Right. Because if you're looking for the true solution, which is uh, some form of taxation that increases without pushing them over the edge of, uh, of lack of investment, you've got to find the sweet spot and you can't do it by throwing darts at the board. You've got to have the information to do it. So it's going to take a little effort and a little money and some experts, maybe some cooperation from the oil company if they're willing to do it. I don't know if they'd even be willing to do it at this point. Yeah, I lived I lived through that effort in in 24 2004 2005 2006. It was a very good effort. I mean, there were there were people who were really trying to trying to legitimately 7 8 uh it went on after that. Legitimately trying to come to the right answer. Um and and we sort of we sort of got there but then didn't get there in, in the end because of because of the Palin issues. Right. Um 
I got off the ball. Uh, and Vico, right. Vico contributed yeah. to that as well. The LLC change, that was something that, and, and that was a question that I had because I have not watched this closely enough to know the answer to this. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm scrolling back, trying to find the comment here real quick. Uh, Bradley says, so if we get rid of the Hill Corp loophole, would that mean that every LLC in the state would have to pay a corporate tax? And I don't know if it's specific to Hill Corp or not. Brad, are you familiar enough with it to be able to answer that? I'm sorry, Brad, I had you, I had you muted during the outro music there. Go ahead. You you can you can limit the uh, the the change to the, the taxation on the S corp to oil to simply to oil companies. We have special rules for taxes on oil corporations, and it's just including uh, oil corporations that are that are organized as S corps uh, in that in that uh, in that group. Right. So it wouldn't affect all the all the rest of them. Um, I mean, I think this is to me, that's a common sense approach. Uh, Donna says it's called the Laffer curve, by the way, that whole investment <laughs> versus the thing. It's Art Laffer, uh, the Laffer curve. So, I mean, to me, that just makes sense. You can't be on either extreme. You can't tax them so much that they just basically pull out and leave, take their toys and go home. But at the same time, you can't just let them run amok and give them, you know, carte blanche to do what they do. What they do, we've got to meet somewhere in the middle on that. And uh, and like we said, the numbers that, that you and I have talked about here in the past has been, you know, four or five hundred million dollars um, in, uh, you know, still available on the table. And if we could find that middle ground, it'd be a good source of revenue and keep everything rolling and uh, and maybe take a little bit of the pressure off. We spent we spend way too much time, way too much time worried about what other states are doing. Alaska is unique. We've got an unique, unique uh, environment. We've got a unique um, a set of regulations. We've got a unique set of challenges out there. And and what works in North Dakota, what works in you know West Texas, what works someplace else uh, isn't isn't quite uh, it, it isn't the rule. I mean, what works in Norway because of Norway's unique. Uh, uh, approach to government investment uh, in the oil industry over there in oil field development is unique. Closest we come is really the North Sea. I mean, Alaska has always sort of grown up with the North Sea, always been developed with the North Sea. And looking at the North Sea, the English, the, the UK portion of the North Sea is it gives you some feel for what others are doing in a similar environment uh, to Alaska. But we spend way too much time worrying about that. What we need to worry about is is figuring out the revenue maximizing point, the Laffer curve for the oil industry. We need to figure out the the the, the revenue max, uh, maximizing point um, uh, for for the oil industry here, based upon factors here. And as I say, I mean we've got Department of Natural Resources does decline curves all the time. That's how we get the production uh, forecast uh, uh, out there. They go talk to the companies. They get information from the companies. They develop their own view of what the decline curves are going to be. They develop their own view of when uh, of when fields are going to be developed. Uh, they have they get information from the oil companies to, to be able to do that, um, and and they develop those 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 production curves. That and right. production curves have been pretty good lately. So you can so you, you know we've got the information to be able to do it. We just don't focus on doing it. We focus on fighting about irrelevant things because that's what people want to fight about. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Final thoughts here, Brad, as we wrap things up on the weekly top three in the last 15 days of the session. I think, I think you know, we're, we're, if we're headed for a special session, that's fine. Special session on, on fiscal matters, getting a financial plan, that's fine. Um, I think Dunleavy's got the right goal out there in talking about everybody gives a little. Uh, I think there has to be some hard effort put in on the oil tax side to find the right answer, but the answer is out there. Uh, and, um, and we just need to, to put in the effort to, to find it. They need to contribute. Alaskans need to contribute to some degree, but we need to do it fairly across all Alaska families. Um, and, um, and if we need to push that to a, a special session, let's do it and, uh, and, and let's get it underway. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, thank you, Brad, for sticking over. We appreciate it. Folks, Michael, we have more. Always- thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.